Hey there, guitar fanatics. Today we're going to talk about one of the essential building blocks for every type of guitar playing. And it's a concept you probably think you know, but you probably don't know it well enough, and that's triads. So triads are one of the most important building blocks for learning the fretboard. They're an absolutely essential tool for really becoming familiar with the entire neck of the guitar. And this is not only true when you're soloing or improvising, they're also an essential tool for good rhythm guitar playing. When you hear the great David Gilmour do something like this in the solo to comfortably numb, And then we hear a rhythm part like this and another brick in the wall. Well, that's all triad based. You might hear Mark Knopfler play a lead line like this in Sultans of Swing. Or this one. Well, guess what? That's triads. Or here's another one. The great Steve Lukather played this rhythm part in the pre-chorus to Rosanna. And then he turned around in the first few bars of the solo and played this. Tell him what that is, Charlie. It's triads. So what we're going to do today is take a look at triads on several different levels, starting with what they are and how to build them. We're going to get into how to find them all over the neck of the guitar, how to play them in multiple different ways. And you really need to stick around for some of the more advanced levels because I'm going to show you a couple of pro tips that just might do more for your guitar playing than any other bit of advice you've ever gotten. And I'm being 100% totally serious when I make that statement. Because it's one thing to know about them. It's another thing entirely to really know how to use them and make them sound good. So this lesson is going to start easy. It's going to get progressively harder. And it's all designed to get you to the point of what I call fluency. And that's that place we want to go where we're just rocking and we're flowing and we don't have to really think about anything. So buckle your seatbelts because we're going in. Oh, and I'd like to ask you a favor and that's to subscribe to the channel. I'm out here busting my butt to make these videos every week. I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. Okay, enough of that. Let's play some guitar. So here we are at level one. Let's talk about what is a triad and where do they come from. So triads are three note chords that come from taking a note of a scale, skipping a note, adding the next note, skipping a note, and adding the next note to get our three notes. Let's take the major scale, C major to be specific, and we've got the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and that brings us back to C. Now if we start on the C note, skip D, add the E note, skip F, and add the G note, we get the notes C, E, and G, those notes make up a C major triad. A couple of points to note. The notes C, E, and G are each what we call a third interval apart. So if C is one, D would be two, E would be the third note we come to. We call that a third interval. If we start at E, count that as one, go to F, and then go to G, G is again a third interval away from E. So triads are made by stacking together notes that are third intervals apart. Now getting a little more specific with those thirds, if we look at the fretboard, we see that E is four notes away from C. We're gonna call that a major third interval. Likewise, if we go to the E note and then look at G, we see that's only three frets away. So E to G is what we're gonna call a minor third interval. Now, why is that important? It's because it's what makes major triads major and minor triads minor, what kind of third it has as that middle note. Now, a major triad has its starting note, a note a major third away, and then another third, a minor third away on top of that. A minor triad has our root, 
a note a minor third away from the root, and then a note a major third away from that minor third. One other thing we might want to make note of is that note on top is a fifth interval away from our root. Now there's actually two other types of triads we can make by manipulating the third and the fifth, and that would be augmented triads and diminished triads. But we're going to stick with major and minor for now. Actually, let's just stick with major. That's enough theory for now. And let's move on to level two and do some playing. Now in level two, we're gonna take a look at some major triads and we're gonna play shapes that have one note on a string. You know, one of the really challenging things about learning to play guitar is you can play the same note in several different places on the neck. And that means there's gonna be multiple shapes that you can use to play the same triad. And while that's kind of a pain in the butt, you need to learn as many of these shapes as you can because you never know where you're going to be on the guitar neck when you're improvising and playing solos. And you always want to be able to find the notes that you need in that spot. You don't want to have to jump all around the guitar neck all the time. And that's that concept of fluency that I mentioned earlier. So let's start by finding triad shapes all over the neck where we're going to play one note per string. So anytime you're learning shapes like this, I recommend finding our root note on the sixth string and then finding your third and your fifth on the other two strings and then starting on the A string, finding the root note, finding a shape, go to your D string, start with the root note, find a shape and so on across the fretboard. So on the low E, we've got a C note at the eighth fret. There's an E note at fret seven of the A string and a G note at fret five of the D string. So there's our first shape. If we start on the A string, we've got a C note at fret 15, an E at fret 14 of the D string, and G at fret 12 of the G string. Of course, we could also play that down in the open position. Now on the D string, we've got a C note at fret 10, we've got an E at fret 9 of the G string, and a G at fret 8 of the B string. And lastly, we've got a C note at fret 5 of the G string, We've got an E at fret five of the B string, and we got a G at fret three of the high E. So now we've made it all the way across the neck vertically. I'll make the point now, you'll hear it again before the video's over. You need to map out these shapes in all 12 keys. Seriously, you do. Okay now, let's move on to level three. Now in level three, we're gonna learn how to play triad inversions vertically across the neck. So just what the heck is an inversion? Well, you remember how we build our major triads by combining the first, the third, and the fifth notes of the major scale. Well, so far we've been playing them in that order. All an inversion is, is starting your triad on either the third or the fifth, and then playing in order from there. So what we call our root form of the arpeggio, we play the root, the third, and the fifth. The first inversion would be starting on the third, then playing the fifth, and then the root, our second inversion would be to start on the fifth, then playing our root, and then playing the third. Let me show you how I'd like you to practice these inversions and getting familiar with moving them across the neck. Let's go to our familiar C root form, starting on the low E string and playing frets eight, seven, and five on the E, A, and D strings. That's our root form. Now let's go to that E on the A string and play E, G, and C. That's first inversion. Then we're gonna start on the G on the D string and play G, C, and E. There's our second inversion. Lastly, we're gonna start at the C again on the fret five of the G string. We're gonna play C, E, G, and that gives us another root form. So that's phase one of this third level. For phase two, we're gonna start at the E note and play the first inversion. So we're gonna to go to the 12th fret of the low E string and we've got E, G, and C. We're gonna to move to the G on the A string. Once again, we've got G, C, and then E. That's our second inversion. We're back to C at the 10th fret of the D string and we've got C, E, G, that's our root form again. And then lastly, we've got an E at the ninth fret of the G string, and we're gonna play E, G, C, 
or 351, that's first inversion. And you already know the last part of this level is going to be to start on a G note and play the second inversion and move across the neck from there. So we've got a G at fret 15, we've got C at fret 15, and E at fret 14. There's our second inversion. So now we're starting on our root, C, E, and G, root form. We go to the E at fret 14 of the D string. We've got E, G, C. There's our first inversion. And then lastly, we've got a G at the 12th fret of the G string. We're going to play C, G, C, and E. So once again, that second inversion. So those are our different triad inversions played vertically across the neck. We started on the root form. We started on the first inversion. Then we started on the second inversion and made it all the way across. And that moves us on to level four. Now in level four, we're gonna look at two string triad shapes and we're gonna move those and their inversions horizontally up the neck. We mentioned earlier how it can be really frustrating learning to play guitar because you can play notes in more than one place. Well, that can also be a tremendous opportunity. We've been playing triad shapes that sit across three strings. Well, let's learn a shape that sits on two strings and we're gonna learn to move these shapes all the way up the neck of the guitar and play our different inversions on a set of two strings. So check this out. For the root form starting on the low E string, we can play C at the eighth fret and the E and G at fret seven and 10 of the A string. Moving up to fret 12 in the E note, we get our first inversion by adding C and G at frets 10 and 15 of the A string. If we go up to fret 15, we're gonna play our second inversion. We're gonna play our G note at fret 15, and then we play C and E at frets 15 and 19. Here are those same shapes on the A string. Here they are on the D string. Now when we play them on the G and the B strings, they're gonna change slightly because of the tuning of the B string, but we can still find them easily. Here's our root form. Here's our first inversion. Here's our second inversion. And then lastly, when we get to the E and B strings, our shapes go back to what was familiar. Well, all right, now we can find major triad inversions going across the neck or moving up and down the neck. But you know, we've got to use more than just major tonalities in our playing, and that takes us to our next level. Level five, minor triads and their inversions. Now we've been concentrating on major triads to get used to the concept, and we know that we build a major triad with a root note, a major third, and a fifth interval. Well, now we're gonna play minor triads and we're gonna change up our formula and we're gonna play a root, a minor third, and a fifth. So our C major triad, we had the notes C, E, and G. To get C minor, we're gonna flat that major third and we're gonna have the notes C, E flat, and G. So we go from this to that. So let's take a look at these inversions across the fretboard. Let's start up with our root shape at the eighth fret of the low E string. We've got C major. We're gonna flat that third. Now we got C minor. If we move up to the 11th fret, we've got C major. Let's flat that E note. Now we've got C minor. If we move up to the 15th fret, here's our second inversion major C triad. We're gonna flat that E note at the 12th fret to the 11th fret of the D string, and that gives us C minor. And let's do the same thing on the rest of the string sets. Starting with the C note at the third fret of the A string, we've got that root form. If we go up to our E flat at the sixth fret, we've got this shape. If we go up to the G at the 10th fret of the A string, we get that shape. Moving on to D, G, and B strings. We've got a G note, which would give us our second inversion at the fifth fret. We've got a C note at the 10th fret of the D string. We've got an E flat at the 11th fret of the D string. See how those shapes change. Lastly, on the G, B, and E strings, 
There's our root form with a C at the fifth fret of the G. Here's our first inversion with an E note at the eighth fret of the G string. And lastly, we're going to have our second inversion. We've got a G note here at the 12th fret of the G string. Now, of course, it should go without saying we can do that same process with our two string shapes. We just got to flatten that third. And as I've said before, you need to do this for every single key, even the crazy ones like A flat or E flat. And in this next level, you're going to see just how important it is to learn how to play these things through every key. Here we are at level six, and we're going to practice playing our shapes through the circle of fourths. So for level six, I'm going to introduce you to the practice exercise that probably did more for my ability to really learn the guitar neck and flow when I'm soloing than any other exercise I've come across. And that's playing through the circle of fourths. I do this for every new concept I learn, and I have been for more years than I care to consider. I just can't recommend it enough if you're serious about getting better. The idea is to take a concept, and today we're going to use major triads, and we're going to play that concept through all 12 keys by moving continuously in fourth intervals. Now, you'll often see the 12 keys and their relationship in a circular diagram, but I think it's easier to visualize it in a linear way, and that would look like this. Starting with C and moving up a fourth, we get F. From F, if we move up a fourth, we've got B flat. From B flat, moving up a fourth, we've got E flat. Move up a fourth from E flat, we've got A flat. Moving up a fourth from A flat, We've got D flat, up a fourth from D flat. We've got G flat, up a fourth from G flat. Gives us a B. Up a fourth from B. We've got E, up a fourth from E. We've got A, up a fourth from A. That gives us D, up a fourth from D. We've got G and then up a fourth from G. We're back to our starting C note. So let's give it a try. I'm going to talk you through it slowly until you get a good feel for the concept. And then I'll give you some other tips on how to really practice with it. Remember now, we've got several different triad shapes we can play. And the idea is to kind of randomize the shapes we play by finding a triad in all 12 keys in sort of one general area of the fretboard. So let's go down to the open position. We're going to start with our cowboy chord C shape. We've got our one, three, five. Here's an F at the third fret of the D string. One, three, five. Now we got to go to B flat. We got a B flat at the first fret of the A string. There's a one, three, five. Now we've got an E flat. We've got it right here next to our B flat. Got to go to A flat. Here's one at the fourth fret of the low E. Got a D flat right next to it. Got a G flat here at the second fret of the low E. Got a B right next to that. E right next to that. Let's go to our A at the fifth fret of the low E. D right next to it. G at the fifth fret of the D string. We've been through all 12 keys and now we're back to C. Well, that's pretty awesome. Let's take it up to our familiar shape at the eighth fret and run through the same exercise. Here's C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, B, E, A, D, G, and that would bring us back to C. So if you haven't done this exercise before, we're really ingraining two things at once. We're drilling in where the root note for each triad sits all over the fretboard. And we're memorizing those triad shapes and we're really burning them into our DNA by doing it in real time, in the moment. Which is, if you think about it, what playing solos and improvising is all about, right? Now, at first, it's okay to kind of hunt and peck, but as you get better at it, I want you to start practicing with a metronome. You could use three note shapes and play triplets. 
You could play one, three, five, three with each arpeggio and make it into eighth notes or sixteenth notes. You could also combine two different shapes and make two octave triad shapes like this one. And we could go on and on. I could probably make an entire video on just this practice exercise alone. Now the result of this exercise, if you put a little time into it, is that no matter where you are on the fretboard and no matter what chord progression you're playing over, you're going to be able to find these triads and they're going to give you a base or sort of a blueprint that you can use to improvise. And that idea of improvising and soloing, that takes us to our seventh and final level. Now in level seven, we're going to talk about turning our triads into musical licks and phrases. Level seven is all about taking these little shapes that we've been learning and turning them into music. I've used the term triad based several times in this video to describe both licks and rhythm parts by all time great guitarists like David Gilmour and Mark Knopfler. I'm going to show you a trick that is worth more than its weight in gold and is going to do more for your ability to improvise cool solos than you can probably imagine right now. And here it is. You can add just one extra note to a triad and it makes what we could call a melodic cell. Now I call these triads plus one. And it's like a magic trick that turns our triad into a complete melodic statement. I'm going to show you a few examples here and I promise you, you're going to have some massive aha moments. Let's go back to the opening of that solo of Comfortably Numb by David Gilmour. Everybody considers that to be one of the all time great guitar solos. So over a chord progression that goes from D to A, David opens with the notes F sharp, G and F sharp. And those notes are the major third and fourth intervals of D. And we've all heard this kind of thing with a D chord. We call it a suspended fourth and it's a trick musicians use by playing that non-chord tone, which is the fourth, and it creates a little bit of tension that we're able to resolve by going back to the major third. You've heard it a million times and it always works. Then we go back to the A chord and David does it again. He plays E, D, C sharp, A and E. Now A, C sharp, and E are the one, three, five of A, but that D note, it's the fourth again. So he's basically just expressing this little rhythm part we've heard a million times. As a lead line. Now watch this little trick. We can repeat that pattern easily and move it through multiple octaves. Here's the original playing from the E at the 17th fret of the B string. We can also play that E at the 14th fret of the D string. And then we've got E at the 12th fret of the E string. And we've just covered almost the entire neck of the guitar. Now we've got a D note right here at fret five of the A string and we've got this triad shape with a one, three, five. Well, what if we add in the second? Now we're playing the intervals one, two, three, five. Let's take that up the fretboard. And we get to that A at the 17th fret of the E string, we can play five, four, three in the root. Let me add a little phrasing there. Going back to the A chord, what if we were to play 3, 2, 1, 5 at frets 21, 19, 17, and 17? Let me do that with a little phrasing. And then we could shift positions to the 14th fret and we could play 3, 4, 5, 1. And we do that with a little phrasing. And we could also play something like this. Take that all the way down the neck. Now here's another idea. This is a lick from the Sultans of Swing solo. If I start at the D at the seventh fret of the G string and I play one, two, three, five, one, 
and back down. Well, that's okay, but it's a little bit lame. But if I play it as a pedal steel bend, well, it sounds pretty awesome. The next part of that lick is over the A chord. Now we're in a different key than Salt and Swing, so use your imagination. But we play D, C sharp, A, E, F sharp, E, C, and A again. So that's just an A triad with the fourth and sixth thrown in. We add a couple of slides into that lick for phrasing. We put it all together. It sounds really, really nice, and everything we're playing has got triads at the core. Let's do one more example. I mentioned Steve Lukather and the Rosanna solo at the beginning of the video. It starts out over an F chord, and Steve plays F, G, and A. Well, that's the one, two, three of F, and he follows that by playing C, F, F, C, G, G, and C, A, A. Well, those are the intervals five, one, two, three. So that's another triad plus one, if you will. And he's turned it into a little pedal point lick. And here's one last killer pro tip. We can create a little pedal point lick with each inversion. Let's play the F triad root form at the fifth fret. We're gonna play F, A, B flat, and C. We can play the A at the 10th fret of the B string and turn our first inversion triad into a triad plus one by adding the D or the sixth. And lastly, let's go up to the C at the 13th fret of the B string. We're gonna turn the second inversion into a triad plus one by playing the fifth, the root, the second, and the third. That gives us three awesome little musical statements. And we can play them anywhere on the neck. For instance, I could play those on the A and D strings. And all I was doing was playing these triad plus one shapes and adding a little bit of phrasing to make them come alive. And I just really wanted to illustrate the power of getting fluent with these triad shapes. With these little three note chords and some imagination, you can follow in the footsteps of some of the greatest players in rock history. Triads can and should be a major part of your vocabulary. They make it super easy to be super melodic with your soloing and they're also great for your rhythm playing. Here's another really awesome video that's chock full of other triad ideas. They're gonna be awesome for your soloing. Check it out, it's gonna be great for your playing. I know you're gonna love it and I will see you soon.